Happy Friday, everybody. I hope you're having a blessed day in the inside. If you're in a warm place um, like I am, where I am just enjoying myself, I'm just showing you. I don't know if you can see the color of the flowers outside, but I'm enjoying myself on the inside. <laughs> uh, air condition. I'm actually working from home today, so I wanted to go ahead and make a video. I hope everybody's blessed. And if this is your first time on my vid video, hey everyone, uh, I'm the Oracle and I like to do vlogs about different aspects of the Jehovah Witness religion slash cult slash organization. And I like to talk about different things that I've experienced my goal with my vlogs is to reach out to people that are still going through the process of healing and making peace with the fact that yes you've been lied to you've been duped and there's a lot of things that you don't know or you didn't know or you're realizing and you're trying to put it all together so today's topic is called the Jehovah Witness scandals, the good, bad, and the ugly. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to talk about some of the things that I experienced or found out about or realized about this organization and this cult and the members in this cult. So one of the things that I know about the Jehovah Witness organization, and I'm going to kind of mirror what Leah Remini said when she actually did the special on the Jehovah Witnesses, is that from the outside, people look at the Jehovah Witnesses as these well-dressed kind of Mormon-like people, free from scandal and blemishes. And I know that they're sort of public relations piece that most of the time when you meet Jehovah Witnesses in the the field work or now they're doing the cart work, which is a funny 360 or uh, 180, they're basically giving this, this narrative that the Jehovah Witness religion is different from all other religions because the scandals that you see in other organizations, other religious organizations, don't exist and are minimal. And that's actually, <laughs> it's actually the opposite. And I think one of the things that the Jehovah Witness organization does very well is they control the information. And I think that that's one of the reasons that the information age and technology and social media and YouTube and, and other places where people can actually exchange information is hurting them. Because when I was growing up and I've been out of the organization for over 25 years, there wasn't a lot of information from different congregations. There wasn't, like you didn't really hear about an, a congregation that was um, dissolved. You may hear a gossip, but you really didn't hear about like, you know, a congregation where somebody killed two people while the elder was giving a, a, a topic or, or, or giving a talk or you didn't hear about pedophilia. You didn't hear about a lot of the things that actually when you do the research have been going on since the beginning of the, the inception of this religion. And so what they're really good at is controlling the flow of information. And what they do is they try to control the narrative by saying we are the only people that is going to give you accurate information. And so I wanted to just kind of talk about some things that I'm aware of. And I want to start with the good. And the good is, in my mind, people that defied 
living in a controlled environment and still manage to get away and share information with other people or get their college education or make a plan and exit on their own terms. And I'm gonna talk about some of the scandals that I know. This is not a sensational like video. It's kind of more of a, let's, let's actually talk about the truth about the truth. And that this organization is just as dirty and just as, has just as many scandalous things going on as any other group. And because it's such a highly controlled group, you don't even know about some of the scandals that are underneath the surface when you go to a congregation and get love bombed or you see these people that are Stepford, when you talk to them, the kids are like talking in unison and people are all acting like you just won the lottery when you walk into a Kingdom Hall and you're new. And what you don't realize is that actually behind that veneer is a lot of scandals and a lot of lies and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of mistreatment and a lot of sweeping things under the rug. But I wanted to first start with some good things that I that I know. Um, there's quite a few people. We used to, my brother and I used to talk to so many Jehovah Witness children that were our peers that we grew up with. And out of all that group, because I mentioned before that my parents were divorced when I was eight and they remarried and my my father actually moved out of state but close enough that we would see him on the weekend so we actually knew of three or four congregations that we were actively involved in because besides going to the congregations that my parents were in because my father went to one my mother went to another we also were very close with my paternal grandparents and my maternal grandparents. So we knew all the people that went to both of their congregations. And because I am a generational Jehovah Witness, meaning my parents were born into this cult and my grandparents were converted when they were fairly young, I know lots of people and know their, their family and my family knows their family. So it's very extensive. So having been around all of these different congregations and interacted with all these different congregations, I've actually, you know, seen and heard a lot of different things and experienced a lot of different things in terms of different scandals that people hid behind. So the good the good is people that I knew that were able to, I don't want to say pretend, but basically I know two people that I grew up with because again, we knew a, we knew an extensive group of young people from three or four different congregations that we went to. And I was very impressed. There was like three or four young people who went through the motions and they secretly got scholarships to go to college and as soon as they turn 18, I, I remember one young woman in particular, she basically um, got a scholarship, left, went in a dorm, and basically left the Jehovah Witness organization. She had a, a counselor at school that um, pretty much was very close with her, and she works on Wall Street. And her parents are like another generational Jehovah Witnesses, but she plotted that the whole time. Um, another, another sort of good, if you will, um, scandal was someone that was in Bethel. And I found out about this person when I first, um, maybe it's been a long time, but the first time that the information age helped me, um, I, after about 10 years, my grandfather passed away and because there were so many things going on in the Kingdom Hall, I hadn't been in Kingdom Hall in like 10 years. I was really like, there are so many things that have changed in this in, in the Jehovah Witness organization. I really, really want to know what's going on. So I just, at that time you could Google. So I Googled something and found this 
forum, this online forum where I was actually able to communicate with current and former Jehovah Witnesses. And there was um, like three or four people that were in Bethel at the time. And some of them were pretty high ranking that was sharing like really great information and was giving, um, I didn't realize I had this all the way up, sorry. Um, <laughs> they were sharing a uh, really good information about the, the, the inner workings of Bethel. And that was actually the first time, the first time that I was actually aware of the truth about how this organization worked and what really went on in Bethel. Like I was like, when this, when this person was talking about just, I guess the homosexual aspect that I, I'm, I'm not at all, I, I'm not a homophobe or anything like that, but I think one of the things that people that are not at Bethel, especially women who, you know, didn't marry someone that was a Bethelite, you're really not going to have any inside knowledge uh, about what goes on at, at the headquarters of the Jehovah Witness or the Watchtower and Track Society Corporation headquarters. You're not going to know. And I had left when I was 17, so I really did not. And actually, I, I don't want to say I didn't know. I didn't care enough to know. So hearing about all these secret things that were going on was stunning. But the reason why I call it good is that he was, this one person was actually giving us all of the inside information in terms of like, you know, anytime there was like any type of memo that was going to be sent out and announced at the Kingdom Hall, we got all that stuff ahead of time. And I know that still goes on. I mean, I honestly believe, and you know, don't quote me on this, but I actually believe that one of the governing body is actually a double agent. And um, I don't want to say who it is, but I have reason to believe that um, it's either a governing body person or a helper that is actually a double agent. And I also believe, and I I, th I got this from, from the person because I actually communicated with him a few times directly, is that there's actually a faction at Bethel right now that are totally against what's going on in the organization and are really just there to um to try and change it so there's it's it's not as uniform as people think um there's 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 some inner issues but my my uh my hats go off to all of the people that were strong enough and and mindful enough and planned plan well enough to be able to go to college, to take their families out, to keep people informed on what's going on. So those are scandals where the Jehovah Witness organization tries to make it seem like there's this, everybody's on the same page, everybody's in agreement. And it's really not because the leakers, if you will, are all over. It's not one or two people. There's no way that the XJ, ex Jehovah Witness community would know as much as they do if it wasn't for all of the leakers in the congregation. And they're not bad people. I think, and when I talk about some of the good and the hypocritical, it's not because they are, you know, have an ax to grind and they're bad people. It's because they've seen some of the practices and they really don't agree with it. And I mean, I've actually communicated with, with women that, you know, they're in it, but they're not because they don't agree with women being seen as secondary and not having any type of, of opportunity to lead, even though they, they give so much of themselves. And, you know, that was one of the reasons that I left because I'm, I can't be involved in any organization that teaches that who I am inherently is inferior like there's absolutely no way that you're going to get me to nod my head in unison and try and teach that my brain is smaller and because of that i am somehow less of a human being like that's absolutely ridiculous but now i kind of want to take it to the bad 
sorry i had to change hands i'm actually working i'm actually using my late lunch to make this video so i do apologize for the up and down um i want to talk about some personal scandals that i'm aware of and i i, I actually talked about this with my husband because I don't want to, I, I don't want to sensationalize it too much, but I want to talk about the bad and the hypocritical that I know personally. So one of the, one of the things that actually happened to me when I was deciding to leave this organization was the first time that I was aware that there was a pedophilia problem in the Jehovah Witness organization. And that was when I was living with my grandparents and my grandfather was presiding overseer and my grandmother shared some information with me about one of the brothers in the Kingdom Hall. So this brother was disfellowshipped for, um, he was gay. And gay is not a one-to-one -one with pedophilia, but this young man was gay and he had had some inappropriate interaction. I don't know if it was sex or it, whatever it was, he got disfellowshipped for it. The, the young man was probably around 12 or 13. So they didn't feel that, and the man was about 28, 29 at the time. So it was never reported to the authorities that he was disfellowshipped. And he got, he, um, and he still came to the Kingdom Hall all the time. He got reinstated. Now, this happened before I ever was going, you know, living with them. So he had gotten this fellowship one time. So they had worked with him. You know, he said he was very sorry. Um, they, they told him that, you know, he needs to get over those, those, you know, evil tendencies and you know get married and have children so again you, you see how this organization is um so he he studied he came to all the meetings they reinstated him so then he had another indiscretion with a, a male that was like 16 years old they did not they just fellowshiped him and then um you know he came back and did the same thing and then they reinstated him this was never reported to the authorities. Now, I was there when he was reinstated, and I remember all of the people running up and hugging him because they don't tell, they never, no one knew why he was getting in trouble. No one knew that he was gay. No one knew that he was molesting a young person. Now, my understanding is in both times, the young boys were living with their single mothers and they moved to different congregations. So um, again, when he was reinstated, the mother and her son had moved to another congregation and he was playing it like he wasn't gay, he wasn't a pedophile or whatever. And I didn't know it because I actually knew the guy and I was, I don't want to say friendly because I was like 16 at the time, but he was, he was always hanging around like the teenagers and the young kids. And I didn't know anything. This is when it happened. So again, the, he got reinstated. And I remember that the brothers were encouraging him to get married and to leave those desires behind. So what happened is there was a young woman who had a little boy. Her son was maybe around 10 and she had just gotten uh, baptized and she was, you know, had the zeal for Jehovah. So all of a sudden I see a lot of the brothers trying to invite her and her son to different gatherings they were having and try and push him to talk to her. And he had, she had no idea about any of this. So the only reason that I ever found out any of it is because he took her little son under his wing. And the only reason I ever found out is that my grandfather would take forever. Again, he was a presiding overseer to come out of the Kingdom Hall. We would be like almost the last people to leave. And my grandmother would always wait for him. So we would be there for a long time. So we would be sitting there watching people talking, hanging around after every meeting. So what happened is 
I was sitting in the car with my grandmother and I saw my grandmother staring at this man talking to this little boy and I saw her face. Like I knew my grandmother like the back of my hand and I saw her glaring at the man and he caught her looking at her, looking at him. And I, I remember like, you know, cause I thought the guy was mad cool. He was always funny, da da da. So I said, I said, Grandma, why are you, why are you looking at him like that? And she was like, Never mind. And I said, Grandma, just tell me. And uh, my grandmother actually told me this whole story, and I was horrified. I was like, What? Like again, it was the first time. It was the first time I was like, why, why don't, like, I, there were so many questions, like, why isn't he in jail? Why are the brothers still trying to get him to marry a woman? And, you know, she's like, just imagine if she did get married, no one told her, she would not know. But the thing that bothered me is that he was taking that boy under his wing and he was just would hang around this little boy. So here's what happened. I, I left and I, I, I told, you know, I tell everyone that here's my story. I got this fellowship because I didn't want to be a witness. There's a video on it. Look at my, um, you know, look at my homepage. You'll find the whole story. So a few years go by and I actually was over my grandmother's house just visiting her and his name actually came up. Um, and she told me that he had gotten disfellowshipped again. And she told me that the woman had caught him touching her son inappropriately and freaked out and called the police. And the hypocritical part was, is that the brothers put her on reproof for not going to the brothers first. And I, you know, I already knew my grandmother was completely conditioned by this organization, but I remember looking at her and I just gave her a look. My grandmother's the type of person that is so committed to something that there's nothing that you can say that's going to change her mind. And she would always say Jehovah's going to take care of it because that's like new light. You know, when stuff happens and they know it's wrong, they attribute it to the people and not the organization that sanctions this kind of behavior. And that's really about my sort of other part of this conversation. The hypocritical part is the incorrect behavior, the incorrect shunning and reinstatement situation that goes on. Because if you look at the most famous Jehovah Witness pedophilia case, the one that showed that the Jehovah Witness organization keeps a database of, um, of sexual abuse, and that was the Australian Royal Commission, but also the, the, um, the Conti, the Candace Conti, uh, uh, you know, um, civil court case where the Jehovah Witness organization was sued for millions of dollars. And part of that, um, part of the judgment against the Jehovah Witnesses was for them to actually produce the database of sexual abuse that had gone on in each of the kingdom halls and they refused to do it. They'd rather incur a fee. If you actually looked at all of the cases that were alleged and some of it, which they disfellowship people for, how many of those actual cases were brought to the authorities? And how many did that brother do like the one that I talked about that went to my grandparents' kingdom hall, went to the kingdom hall, uh, you know, sat in the back and then got reinstated? When they get reinstated, they were not, they don't inform the congregation that there's a sexual predator. And I think that's the problem. So instead of, and again, um, as, as Megan's law has it in the United States, you have to inform people. And because it's a religious uh, you know, congregation, I don't think that that actually extends to congregations, but it should. Because so many kids 
have been molested by convicted. And when I say convicted, I mean confessed it and convicted in the organ in the religious Jehovah Witness organization. And yet you still have this person being around children. But it's not just about pedophilia because that's that that's a whole book. That's a whole, you know, like there's so many things about this organization that are stunning to me because when I was growing up, they controlled the information to the point that most Jehovah Witnesses did not know about the pedophilia that was going on. And if you watch my video about my grandfather, which was probably the most devastating thing that I found out about my family, is that I found out that my own grandfather was a pedophile that had raped and molested my aunt. And never, my grandmother, he was never even taken to the brothers. My grandfather never even went to a judicial committee over any of it because he was a man and there was a two witness rule. So there's actually a lot of Jehovah Witness elders that are guilty of pedophilia, but have never even been taken to the brothers. Because if they have positions of authorities and they are in a situation where, if you know the Jehovah Witness culture, women are ranked below men. And men that are actually in positions of authority are in a, in a much higher ranking and a lot of women like my grandmother don't want to lose their home and their reputation because this is an organization that victim blames. Now, if someone comes to you and they accuse someone in the Kingdom Hall of apostasy, that person will, there, there's absolutely no way they're going to be able to really get out of it apostasy there that that personal like 99% of the time they'll will be disfellowship like people just listen to the stories there are people that have been disfellowship without even having a judicial meeting but let somebody accuse someone of pedophilia or sexual abuse and if you don't have two witnesses and there's no confession they'll throw that out quicker than you can blink your eye in fact even if you are convicted of it, they're not going to the authorities. They've been forced to do a 180 on that because there have been so many lawsuits. The latest is the one they lost at Montana for $35 million. And they still are trying to contain it and turn it into its isolated cases. No, it's actually thousands of thousands of people that have done it, including my own family. I want to talk about something outside of pedophilia, and this is a personal scandal. And I, again, like I said, I didn't know how I was going to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up because I don't, I don't want to see it. This is very, very close and personal to me. This is my own father. My own father has been disfellowshipped four times, four times. Um, my father is a very violent person. Um, he, he's very violent. He's beat me. He's beat me merc mercilessly. He is, um, he tried to strangle me when I was 16 years old. He actually, at one time, him and my mother were fighting. And this is when I was three or four years old. And my father hit my mother and my mother tried to, you know, like get a little bit of, you know, strengthen herself and threw something at him. And my father lost it because he's such a bully. So he threatened my mother and said that he was going to kill her. And my mother ran out of the bedroom and she ran into my room. My father was shot because as I mentioned, my mother was mentally ill. So my mom, I, I had to get over blaming her for this situation, but she ran into my room. I was laying in the bed asleep. Um, again, I'm like three or four years old. And my mom picks me up and my father and my mom are literally jumping on my bed. And I'm sitting there like a little girl holding my little teddy bear, like what is going on? 
And my father, my mom's hitting, hitting my father and using me to stop him from hitting her. And my father's screaming like, get out of my daughter's room, get out of my daughter's room. And my mother hits him one more time and hits him, really hits him in the eye. And my father loses it. And he grabs my mother and he tells her he's going to kill her. And my father like goes to hit her and my mom puts me up in front of in front of her to stop him and he hits me instead. It it was it was a heavy situation. Um my father and mother are both to blame, but my father is is, is more to blame because he was cheating on my mother and my mother was was just she was she was young she had already been raped by my grandfather married my father when she was 18 years old convinced herself she was totally in love with him and come to find out he's this violent abusive cheating person so my father um was always hard working but around the, the time that i was young there was a recession going on. So my father was trying to find work and couldn't find it. So he had been disfellowshipped and he decided to join the military. So my father left, he went across the country on base and was in the military. And at the time my mom was back and forth with my father because she knew that he was cheating on her. And there was a one particular woman that he was cheating on her with. So, um, but Jehovah Witness family, make it work. You have two children with this man. You got to you gotta stick by him. You got to stick with it. So my mom decides to stay with them. And so she tells my brother and I, we're about, I want to say five or six at the time, that we're going to move and live with dad. And so she packs our stuff up and we go all the way to the base. And she finds out, I don't want to go into the whole thing, but she finds out when she gets to base that my father is actually living on base with his mistress and her two children. And my mother had a nervous breakdown. And which is not, you know, if anybody has degrees in psychology, I actually have a degree in it um, and have worked in the field um, and studied various other things too. Um, you'll know that a nervous breakdown is not a true um, scientific term. She had a, a mental crisis. And long story short, my father married this woman. My father is actually still married to this woman. Oh, but it gets better. My father's an elder, and I, I can almost guarantee you that the people in that kingdom hall where my father's an elder have no idea that the woman that he's married to was his mistress that was running the street and, and going after him and living with him on break, base, pretending to be my mother, because that's what, why my mother had a breakdown, because she checked in and she said, I'm here to see my husband. She gave him all the paperwork. And I remember it. I was just, because I remember, you rem you're triggered by huge emotional situations that happen. Even if you're young, like that'll be a trigger. That'll be a trigger for you. And there's a whole uh, psychological term on how your brain encodes certain things, even when you're young, because it's a traumatic event and your brain will encode it. So when the woman actually came back after we were waiting for an hour, she had to admit to my mother that there's already someone there under her name. And that's one of the reasons. And they had to call my father. My father got in big trouble for it. But we went home. But my father's married to this woman. <laughs> my father's married to this woman. And my father is an elder. And he's married to his mistress. And he been, he's been disfellowshipped four times. But it gets even better. So let me... So my, step, my stepmother... She married my father when I was like eight or nine years old. My father got reinstated and you know, you know, I don't know if you know how people are when they get reinstated, but they go through this whole thing of trying to be the most zealous Jehovah Witness 
that you ever want to meet. So my father put on this this huge, you know, uh, thing that he's the greatest Jehovah Witness you ever want to meet. He's going out on field service all the time. Loves the whole association. Blah 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 blah. But of course, my stepmother had to realize that the universe is the greatest equalizer that there will they will ever be. And so, not maybe a year or so after my father married my stepmother, she lost her son. But then a year after that, my father actually started cheating on her with various other women and got disfellowship. But this is the best part. So there was a woman in the congregation. I've referred to this story a few times. I'm gonna call her Sister Automobile. So Sister Automobile was the 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 pioneer of all pioneers in the Jehovah Witness organization. She was the most um, zealous, most you know, knew all the answers in the Kingdom Hall. Was always going out field service. Was a regular pioneer. All all women in the Kingdom Hall strive to live up to her. So why did my father actually end up having an affair with Sister Automobile while he was disfellowship? And there's a whole story behind that, but I'm just giving a short version. But so my father was disfellowship. He had an affair on my stepmother with a pioneer in the Kingdom Hall that was married with two children. And he and he's not you can't get read this fellowship. She got this fellowship. Then they both got reinstated. And they're both reinstated to this day. And I never forget the time that my father came home. Cause my father is a he's a Jekyll and Hyde. He has a he has a really deep mean streak. So he was sitting at the table, and this was after the fourth time that he had been reinstated. And he was talking about how he had the day off, and he decided to go to the um, the stadium to help clean before the convention the next uh, week. And he talked about the fact that he ran into Sister Automobile, and they were both cleaning the same section at the same time. See, my father actually moved. Because the, the Kingdom Hall that he went to, they would have never, ever given him any positions of authority in that Kingdom Hall. But what a lot of scandalous Jehovah Witnesses do is they do their dirt and then they move to another congregation. Number one, the congregation doesn't even inform people of the pedophiles in their congregation. So they're sure enough, they're not going to tell anybody in the congregation that this new couple that you are actually meeting or actually, you know, got together by ill-begotten ways. That this woman and man that you think is living this happy family and all you know is that members of their family don't talk to him. Like, I don't talk to my father and I never will again in life. But no one actually knows the reasons why. But he can control the narrative and my stepmother can control the narrative to paint them in the best possible light. And I just giggle about it. I mean, I've made peace with all of this. But I share these stories to say that a lot of times when you actually go to the Kingdom Hall and you see people and you see married couples and you see children, you're actually not seeing the whole story. You don't actually know if this person has a, a past of scandals. You don't know what they're doing with their children because that all is part of the facade. I also got some inter interesting intel, which is part of my whole theory on why the Jehovah Witness organization in the past 30 years has been so adamant about the two witness rule. And the intel that I got is that one of the governing body members is a pedophile and has been accused multiple times of inappropriate behavior and he has stood by there's only been one witness so you have to kind of think of, and and i i actually think it's more than this one brother 
Um, I think it's actually multiple people at high rankings. They're all men. Because you have to think about it. Um, if in society today, we can convict people on DNA. Because sometimes there are no witnesses, but that doesn't mean that a crime didn't occur. Right? So sometimes all you have is DNA. For example, a woman can be raped and all she has is their you know, DNA evidence that was deposited on her. And this is what they use to convict somebody. But would the Jehovah Witnesses actually throw that out because there were not two witnesses? What if, but let's just go down this scenario for a second. An elder rapes a Jehovah Witness woman and she doesn't see it because he knocked her out, but they get the DNA evidence and they're actually able to connect it with a brother. Would they disfellowship him if if he if he denies it? It's something to think about because, like I said, there's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of hypocrisy that goes on in Jehovah Witness organization, and a lot of a lot of things that people don't realize. There's a lot of scandals that people don't realize. I'm gonna tell one more story, and this is when I realized that the misogynistic aspect of the Jehovah Witness cult was a little too much for me. And this is about, again, this is one that I actually know. There was a, a family, I, like I said, I, I know a lot of people from the different congregations that I was a part of. And this was a family that I've known since I was born. They were friends of my mother. They had a daughter that was a little bit older than me. So they had moved out of the city that we were in, but we still kept in contact with them. So apparently the daughter had an inappropriate relationship with a newly publisher brother that was that uh, one of the elder in his family was, was working with. But the elder was studying with this young man. He had met him out in the field service and was grooming him to become a brother. So uh my understanding is that the actual the brother did actually get baptized, but they had developed a liking with each other and wanted to date. And, you know, she was old enough that they could actually start talking about marriage. So what happened is they actually ended up having sex. And they both confessed it. They felt really bad about it. Um, and again, if you're young like myself, when when I first learned about the hypocrisy of the organization. When I was growing up, I actually believed that the only reason that you would actually get disfellowship is if you were unrepentant, not because you confessed something. Like, honestly, the way that they, I was taught was that you get disfellowship if you're unrepentant or it's been something that you're habitually doing and they feel like there's no way for you to um, you know, to, to change your ways that you actually need to be excommunicated in order for you to really learn your lesson and not to taint the rest of the congregation. So the young lady that went to her ju judicial meeting first, the brothers, she told the same exact story that the gentleman told. They both basically said that, you know, they got caught up. Um, they were very sorry. So the brothers, when they met with the young woman, they said that she wore skirts above her knees. She, she wore skirts above her knees. So they were going to disfellowship her for that. And then... The, the man, the man did not get this fellowship because, because they felt that he was really sorry. And that really incensed me because I'm like, how can you actually have two set of rules? And the mother, because the mother was really good friends with my mom. And when the mother told my mom the situation, she was horrified because 
her daughter actually got the scholarship and the the gentleman was put on private reproof. When her daughter got reinstated, they treated her like a martyr. Nobody would talk to her. And the mother was absolutely devastated. And it was like the first time that she actually realized how hypocritical the Jehovah Witness religion was. And she told her husband, I'm not going back to Kingdom Hall. I, I'm not. I just can't do it. And she just became inactive. But I never forget that story because I really feel like it's really indicative of the sexism that is in the organization. And that was another scandal that I wanted to share because again, my, my point of sharing this was not to sensationalize it or to ooh, 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 I got some dirt on certain people, especially in my own family. I just wanted to kind of talk about the other side of it. Because, like I said, the Jehovah Witness PR narrative is that we are a clean organization and we don't have certain things. But the actual fact is, no, that this Jehovah Witness organization has imperfect discipline that's done by unqualified people. And the reinstatement is even imperfect because they have pedophiles that they're disfellowshipping and they're shunning and then they're reinstating and they're not telling the rest of the um, congregation about it. But I'm going to have to go because you heard that beep, beep, beep. That means my husband's home. But I want to thank everyone for listening and I will get back to you soon. Have a great rest of your day and stay cool.